Good morning, everyone. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's Sharin Tofai, your favorite host on Heart Attack Live every Tuesday. Uh, thank you for following me. Many of you are joining me on Facebook as a Facebook Live at Dr. Tofai, um, as well as Zoom. And we got tons of questions for today's session because our guest today is Dr. Charlotte Horn. Dr. Horn is, again, I'm trying to bring in the newest talents so you guys can learn from them. She's a hernia surgery specialist at Penn State University at Hershey, Pennsylvania, in the United States. Uh, like me, she has a very, very um, descriptive and informative handle at Twitter. You can follow her at Hernia Barbie and on Instagram at The Hernia Barbie, which implies there may be more than one. I don't know. <laughs> the real Hernia Barbie. So welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited. Me too. So um, there's so much we can talk about because your practice is, is it exclusively hernia or is it uh, predominantly hernia? I'm like 90% hernia um, and hernia related stuff. So yeah. I also do some groin pain. So mesh in, mesh out yeah. um, and then mesh complications associated with hernias. And then I do have small like general surgery practice as well. Yeah, and you work with uh, Dr. Eric Pale, who was a guest of ours with Hernia Talk. Um, that was very fun. He's one of my favorite people. He's just so intelligent, and you guys make a great match. So, he if anyone li lives around Pennsylvania or can fly there, I highly recommend your team. It's he's a great senior partner. It's been awesome to start my career out here. Yeah. So uh, I told you uh, before the show started. We have highly educated, very dedicated audience. They know so much and they've sent a lot of questions this time. We are going to be talking about mesh. Um, everything that people have questions about will be very honest about it. One of the things that I like to do is I'm as honest and transparent as possible in what I say. And that means sometimes I don't know the answer. We are just still in the growth phase and learning phase of things. Um, and we are all human beings, so I can't answer for uh, other surgeons or, you know, uh, medicine is not a perfect science. And we know that we all try our best to do the best for our patients and um, make decisions based on the information that we have. Uh, and I learn a lot from this too. So the whole point of it is to educate others, but I learned so much from my audience. And uh, I'm really looking forward to this session with you. Awesome. Well, I am ready to dive into some questions. All right. Okay. Uh, oh, we already have questions. So we have live questions and pre-prepared -pre questions. I'm really excited about some of the pre-prepared ones because uh, it's going to be a great discussion. But uh, before we go into the live session, let's just at least do a very brief um, you know, discussion so that everyone's on the same page. What is mesh as a broad term? Um, and why do we use it for hernia repair? Awesome. So I think those are two great general questions. Number yeah. one, mesh is sort of anything in general, it's kind of a scaffold that people use to repair hernias um, because we have data that says when you put um, mesh in, it significantly decreases your risk of a recurrence. So in the beginning, when we were fixing hernias, a lot of times people were just sewn back together and they had noticed that there's, you know, upwards of 50 anywhere to, you know, sometimes a hundred percent chance that that hernias were coming back. Right. And so when people started to try to figure out like, how do we decrease this? Um, there was a lot of material that was developed in order to kind of decrease this recurrence. And in general, I'm a huge, like medical history buff. I love all this. Oh, stuff. I love it. Um, so mesh was actually first used in the late fifties. Um, and so that was kind of the first time we were using synthetic meshes. So that's kind of the plastic material. Yeah. And it was actually used in military patients when they had all of these crazy traumatic injuries, there was no way to get the abdomen closed. So yeah. mesh was originally placed in those patients. Um, and since then we've kind of spread into, I would say like three main categories of mesh that people now use in a, a frequent situation. So you have your synthetic meshes, which are mesh that will never go away. 
you have your biologic meshes, which are meshes that are derived from animals or human products. So pigs, sheep, um, and human skin is, is common. And then you have this kind of newer class that's really kind of maybe becoming a little bit more popular is these bioreabsorbable meshes. So these meshes are derived um, from chemicals and they don't stay forever. So you have meshes that last six to eight weeks to meshes that last, you know, about almost two years. And so that's kind of this new category. And so when we talk about mesh, there's a whole bunch of things that can be made of, but sort of broken down into those three groups. And in general, mesh is used to decrease the risk of your hernia coming back. Yeah. And uh, is there like a perfect mesh or like one mesh you should always use? I think the answer is no. Yeah. Um, I think every situation calls for um, a certain, you know, review of what the patient has had before, what the um, pathology is of the hernia, why you're fixing this, um, you know, hernia characteristics, and then you can kind of decide what sort of mesh you use. And additionally, you know, the other thing that makes um, deciding what to use is there are so many places that you can put a piece of mesh. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so everything kind of depends on why are you fixing the hernia? You know, how are you fixing it? And then, you know, what is the goal of the operation? Because sometimes someone has a large hernia, but if you're operating for cancer, nobody really cares if the hernia comes back. You're operating because you want the cancer to go away. Yeah. So sometimes you're kind of mitigating, you know, yes, they have a hernia, but that's not why we're here. And so that's why different meshes or prosthetics will be used to fix that versus if you were operating for just a hernia. Yeah, I always say life before mesh. I mean, mm -hmm. sorry, life before hernia. Because, yes, uh, you teach the residents, or you're at like a, a conference at the at the hospital, and uh, there's big trauma, you know, or there's like a dead bowel or something life threatening, and there's a hernia, mm -hmm. and they deal with the life threatening problem, and they're like, okay, now what do we do with the hernia? I'm like, nothing. Yeah, you know, like that's not important. They need to survive the life threatening portion of the of the operation. And then everything goes well, you know, I can fix the hernia later. You can fix the hernia later, but mm -hmm. that's a secondary problem. There's no need to uh, address that. Totally. Uh, um, yeah. So life before hernia is like my thing to say, I'm, I hope that stick like sticks in them mm -hmm. because every so often you see them adding an extra hour, two hours to surgery to fix mm -hmm. a hernia. I'm like, leave it alone. Yeah. Well, and I think that that's like a common thing because, yeah. you know, when you start to um, interact with, you know, people that are exclusively hernia people, a lot of times yeah. you find that they're probably less aggressive than most about putting in mesh, but it's simply because like at the end of the day, you know, yeah, they might have a big hernia, but you're fine fixing a big hernia. That's what you do all the time. Yeah. It, things get a lot more complicated when you have a prosthetic in there and there is a recurrence. And so that's why it's kind of like, you know, do whatever you need to do to save the patient. The hernia isn't going to kill them. We can take care of it later. Yeah. They often get disappointed because they call me as like the expert, like, okay, now do you like nothing? I'm like what? We okay. thought you'd have some fancy idea. Like, nope, nope. <laughs> the best idea is not to fix the hernia or exactly. you know, be very, very minimalistic. Don't mm -hmm. do a perfect job right now. That's not the important part. Um, mm -hmm. Already you have some nice comments. Thanking you for sharing the history of, of mesh. I think it's so important to, to like right. understand why we do things because there's a lot of misinformation out there that we're putting in mesh because we make more money. Mm -hmm. We're putting in mesh because companies are paying us to do that. Mm -hmm. And I mean, are, are you getting paid to oh, no. mesh in? And I will tell you, I am the cheapest surgeon in the world. So everything that I want, like, I'm like, listen, if I, you know, it's also like this huge misconception of like how much mesh is. Yes. Um, so, you know, the mesh that I use on a regular basis is, you know, often 50 by 50 centimeters because that's my practice and that mesh is $450. So yeah. it's in general, a relatively cheap piece of mesh. Yeah. Um, I'm super cognizant of like OR costs actually. Um, in reality, I think that, you know, yes, there is certainly, um, money that people make as doctors to talk about products and stuff like that. But I think for the most part, people are doing what they should do because they think that it's right. Um, and it's not any sort of financial benefit at all, to be honest. 
Yeah, and I always tell them for angle hernias, there is no extra payment, whether you use mesh or you don't use mesh. Mm-hmm. In fact, so therefore it's actually a money loser. If you really yeah. want to look at it, you can not put in a couple hundred dollars of mesh and get paid the same. Mm-hmm. Uh, and by paid, I mean the hospital, the exactly. surgeon, it's an exact, you know, mm-hmm. you don't get paid differently if you put mesh in and you don't put mesh in. Mm-hmm. And also same with like um, ventral hernia, so abdominal wall hernias, there is an, a small extra payment if you put mesh in. It's mm-hmm. really negligible and definitely doesn't cost, doesn't cover the cost of the mesh. And meshes can be so expensive mm-hmm. that the reimbursement that the um, insurance gives the hospital, not the surgeon, the hospital for that mm-hmm. piece of mesh often doesn't even cover the cost of the mesh. So if we were to get rid of all meshes, more, sp- more people will actually make more money. The yeah. doctors and the hospitals for sure. They hate mm-hmm. that we have like uh, a whole section of the hospital that has like 1500 different types of meshes <laughs> because uh, that's like a drain on their resources. So um, we definitely don't get paid extra to put mesh in. We're not incentivized to put mesh in. Mm-hmm. Um, there, it's actually illegal in the United States. We have a Sunshine Act and everything that separates us. And um, yeah, it's a huge misconception that mm-hmm. we are part of this machine to promote mesh. Mm-hmm. Um, the companies make make money. I mean, that's yeah. why they're there. Yeah, they're not. Well, like... And both you and I are part of a quality collaborative where we want yeah. to know how the mesh that we are putting in is functioning because. You know, I think one of the hardest things about being a surgeon and being a hernia surgeon is there's not a lot of like long-term data, like yeah. five, 10 years down the road. And I'm sure you see a lot of patients that have had hernia repairs years ago. Yeah. And to be honest, like a lot of times, like if you had a hernia repair and it went great, you're probably not going back to see your surgeon. And if you had a hernia repair and it went terribly, you're also probably not going back to see the same surgeon. And so in reality, like we don't have a good idea of how these prosthetics are functioning long-term. Yes. That's why you and I are involved in these quality collaboratives because we want to know who's putting in what, how is it functioning? And we can use all of this like repository of data to be like, listen, like this mesh is not doing what we thought it was. A lot of times there are red flags before device companies are willing to pull it off the market so that we could stop using it before it's starting to hurt our patients when we kind of know that it's not performing as we thought. Yeah, and Ben Paulus uh, from Ohio State University was one of our guests on Hernia Talk. So we did talk about the quality collaborative and uh, encourage anyone who's having any surgery that's hernia related to ask their surgeon whether they are a member and if not to to encourage them to be a member because that helps us learn a lot about what happens to patients after they get any type of hernia repair, whether with mesh or without mesh, but any type of hernia repair. So that's great. Um, The other question that's up here, it has to do with the the concept of absorbable meshes. So why would one use an absorbable mesh if the whole point is that mesh is better than not having mesh because eventually you will, you won't have quote the mesh in you. So why even consider absorbable mesh and does it even work? So I think there are some times when the concern about putting something in there that won't go away is that if that prosthetic gets infected, it has to come out. And so a lot of times when people are operating for you know, infection, if there is an ostomy, so some bowel or fistula or something like that, putting in a prosthetic in that situation, so something that doesn't go away, um, can cause that to become infected. And then it becomes a big problem because you have this infected piece of plastic, basically, that's pretty much never going to heal unless you take it out. Mm -hmm. And so in that situation, people will often put in an absorbable mesh And, you know, as these meshes kind of last a little bit longer, but still go away, the theory is that, you know, the mesh is in there long enough that, especially for the ones that last about 18 months, which is phasics at this point, um, is that it's in there long enough for your body to form enough scar tissue that once it goes away, you have the strength of your body's own scar tissue. So you don't really need the mesh there. And has that data been proven? Because I think we, they just put out the three-year data at this year's AHS meeting. Yeah, so they um, actually just looked at this. They looked at the three-year data and um, they talked about the five-year data. 
Um, and their recurrence rate for their three-year data. So the mesh goes away at 18 months. So this mesh should have been gone for um, almost a year by the time they looked at it in clean cases was 17%, which is a little bit higher than what we have for synthetic mesh, but also not terrible at all. Yeah. So Yeah. And the thought is that it, I believe it's higher, but not that much higher at five years. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and the theory is that you also decrease your surgical site infection and then like wound complications like a hematoma or a seroma. Um, and so that data is a little bit better than some of the other biologic meshes out there in terms of recurrence. Still not as good as a synthetic mesh, Yeah. Um, but uh, it's, it's not bad actually. So why did my surgeon choose the mesh he or she used in me? And by surgeon, I don't mean necessarily you, like your expert, you, you probably have a very, very kind of tailored approach as to what meshes you choose and so on. But in the average surgeon, the average patient, can you explain how, how the decision is made as to what mesh is placed? So I think uh, a couple of things are, what are you fixing? So an, an inguinal hernia might be managed a little bit differently than a um, incisional or an umbilical hernia. Mm -hmm. um, so where you're putting the mesh in. Um, and then another layer to that question is, is what layer of your abdominal wall is the mesh being put in? So if the mesh is touching the bowel, then that mesh needs a barrier coating to it that prevents it from sticking and adhering to the bowel. Yeah. But if it's not going to touch the bowel, then they don't need that barrier coating on the mesh. And then a little bit of the decision making is what they've used before in the past and have had good outcomes with. And so they'll probably continue to use that mesh in future patients. Yeah. And it's also partially uh, a business decision by the hospital. There are different contracts that are made with different companies. Mm -hmm. And depending on how much the surgeons involved, surgeons are often not very involved uh, in those contracts, then that company has like a cadre of mesh options available to the, to the surgeon and they, they tend to use what's available to them and they're not actively involved uh, in that. So you've heard about recalled mesh. Uh, we haven't really had many recalled recently mm -hmm. and by recently I mean in the past couple of years, but um, I get this a lot that, you know, I have recalled mesh in me. We get a lot of phone calls to our office that does Dr. Topai take out recalled mesh? Um, I have, I was, or I see a patient and they're said, they tell me I was told my mesh was recalled. So mm -hmm. what are your thoughts on <laughs> recalled mesh? So I think, you know, that's a tricky question. I think right. the first off, those people obviously need to be seen, examined. And I think in these situations imaged, because if you have a recalled piece of mesh that is doing exactly what it should do, um, and you have no recurrence at all, then you're kind of operating for something that you don't even have a problem with right now. Um, and so, you know, in those situations, if you said, hey, I have a recalled piece of mesh in, but the mesh lies flat, you have no recurrence, I would say, okay, we know you have a recalled piece of mesh in, um, but I would leave it in that situation until you're like, okay, I, I've noticed a bulge. Cause a lot of times the meshes have been recalled, mm -hmm. um, because they're breaking. And so you, a lot of times people will have a recurrence. That's how, you know, um, you know, the only one caveat I would say, or would be a little bit nervous about is there was the, um, atrium C cure mesh that had that plastic ring that broke, you know, you'd have to obviously weigh the risks benefits to taking out the mesh, but that's probably one mesh I'd be a little bit more aggressive about because it has that hard plastic ring. And when people have problems, it's because that ring is stabbing into the bowel and you obviously want to avoid that situation. But I think in general, if the mesh is functioning as it should, even if it is recalled, I'd probably leave it in um, unless I was concerned um, that you know they're at a, a high risk with a low morbidity of surgery to take it out. Yeah, one thing that I've noticed is a lot of patients are led to believe they may have recalled mesh. Mm -hmm. If you actually look at the, the, the mesh um, implant log itself, that mesh has never been recalled, but it's a ploy I've seen. Mm -hmm. um, by the mesh lawsuit companies, the law firms are doing these class action lawsuits, these class action lawsuits to kind of lure in patients 
thinking that they may have recalled and they're under the impression that they do have recalled mesh. Mm -hmm. We really haven't had any recalled mesh of late. The ones that were recalled were all due to packaging issues. Um, they never made it into patients. Uh, there was some delamination uh, issues that were recalled. The physio mesh that you kind of alluded to where there's, uh, it actually tears in the middle that was just too light of a mesh actually, it wasn't as effective of a mesh. And so that was removed for the market by the company. It was never recalled mm -hmm. because there's a higher recurrence rate because it would kind of tear in the middle because it was so thin. Um, the Composites Kugel mesh, back then I think it was called Composites. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Composites uh -huh. uh, Kugel mesh had the ring and um, I actually had several patients that were injured by that. Yeah, so, it's terrible. So, it was like the larger ones and you had to roll it in to put it in and the ring was not pliable. So the ring would break. It became like, if you like, you break a toothpick, how that becomes very sharp. Mm -hmm. um, or if you break like a Q-tip, uh, a wooden Q-tip, it becomes really sharp and then it perforates the bowel. But that was like in, in 2000, it was like it was 2003 or 2005 in that range of, of dates. So if you haven't had an injury since then, you're probably fine. Um, I, as far as I know, there's no mesh that demands recall. I'm sorry, demands removal. Um, if it was been recalled, uh, that was a big question, like, and especially the one that was hurting patients. Um, they redesigned the ring now, so it's, it's more pliable and it's actually, I think, absorbable. It's like a PDS based um, ring, mm -hmm. but, you know, it's scary if you have a park in you, like if your car has a recalled part or something, you take it to the dealer and then they change it. But we don't do that because up until now, there hasn't been any product that demands removal. Um, and even, the, even that composites a thing back in the early 2000s uh, mm -hmm. did not demand removal. You just wait until someone had a complication. And we haven't had any recalls that were dangerous to the patient it was always a packaging thing or there was it was too hot of a like the the packaging would like open up um and so there, it wouldn't be sterile but those are all recalled before they were placed in, in patients and patients need to know whenever anything's recalled it's removed off the shelf immediately oh so yeah you can't claim to have a recalled mesh you know years after it's been recalled because that should not even be around mm -hmm. um and to date, I have not seen any patients that truly had recalled mesh in that was placed in them after it was recalled. So I'm, I'm pretty sure that doesn't happen. Okay, we got a lot of, lot of live questions. So um, here we go. One question has to do with allergy testing. So um, do you guys do allergy testing for? I actually just did it this week. <laughs> oh, tell me about it. <laughs> I, I mean, so here's the thing. I. Um... I certainly believe that people can have this systemic response to mesh. You know, we see it a little bit more in other prosthetics, like the breast implant illness. So there are a select group of people yeah. that, um, yeah, and I'm saying like very select group of people. A fraction of a fraction of a percent, yeah. Exactly, that um, have this response to a prosthetic. Yeah. I think it's super hard to predict. Yeah. I think even if you were in a situation, like you probably are going into the OR with a, a maybe likelihood that it's the mesh that, that's the problem, because, you know, you and I talked about this, the allergy testing, like the skin sensitivity testing isn't great. It's Correct. not very specific. Correct. You know, the data that came out of the University of Alberta, which is my alma mater, oh. um, is also, um, you know, again, maybe 30 to 50% sensitive for picking this up. Like we don't yeah. really have a lot of good data. And yeah. so I actually was thinking about this as I saw a patient that has had multiple surgeries where she has spit every suture. She has a ton of problems. And she was like, I'm nervous to have this surgery sure. because I don't want mesh in me because I'm so concerned that I'm going to have some sort of reaction to it. So I gave her a piece of the mesh that I would use so that she can put it on her skin to see if she has a reaction to it. But, you know, this is where, you know, we were talking about this um, bioabsorbable, this phasic mesh. Like if it, you know, is something that's quite different from the stuff that we normally use, it's around long enough 
that it would probably be effective at fixing a hernia, but it's also not something that's going to be there forever. So heaven forbid she has, you know, allergic reaction, it should go away with time, albeit like two years is a long time. So yes. I think it's a thing. It's very, very um, infrequent that it actually happens. Um, and it's really hard for us to tell despite all of the, you know, testing that we can do, whether or not you're actually allergic or sensitive or have some autoimmune reaction to the mesh. Yeah. I'm impressed that you're starting to do it. So yeah, I've seen people that with real reactions, like you put the mesh in, there's like a big redness on the skin, exactly where the mesh was placed deep to it. Those were like real reactions. I've given, I've told this story before, but it, it was a guy that actually has a polyester allergy. He can't wear polyester socks. Yeah. He used to work in a shipyard where those little polyester resins are like in the air and his eyes would like get all red and watery and blow up. Um, he literally is allergic to polyester and then he had polyester mesh put in him, poor guy. Uh, so that was a true allergy. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's this whole kind of autoimmune or auto-inflammatory reaction. We call it Asia syndrome. So from University of Alberta, we did have Dr. Pro uh, Professor Trevert um, as one of our guests. Uh, I do work with him. His data is from the Netherlands. So he's Dutch and he used to work in the Netherlands and he, and he got, I think, 40 patients that had um, some type of, because he, he's a, I believe he's a rheumatologist. So he, they had some type of like rheumatic disorder after mesh. And so he he's a, really the first to report it for hernia mesh. Um, and we also had uh, a plastic surgeon who's very interested in breast implant illness come mm -hmm. on and kind of help us understand what they're doing on the plastic surgery side and uh, kind of learn from that. But our data, we did, we did quite a bit of allergy testing and I do it with an allergist. They get a full allergic workup, blood tests and um, skin, test allerg skin allergy testing. She has samples of all different types of meshes and sutures. Mm -hmm. And like you said, it is very hit and miss. It's 40% false negative rate. So if you test negative, there's a 40% chance you may actually be positive and the test is just not adequate. Um, blood tests have not been shown to uh, demonstrate any validity in predicting any of this either. Um, so here's a question is, is after hearing you speak of allergy testing prior to the use of mesh, I asked a well-known surgeon also prior on a hernia talk about this when I had my appointment. And I was told that he did not think testing on the outside would be beneficial for use on the inside. I've had allergies since the seventies and do have concern about mesh, which, is, which I know is needed. So to you, I would say, having allergies, like I have allergies, you know, nose runs, mm -hmm. ears, like inside the ears, itches, um, having allergies and being allergic to an implant are two different things. What I've noticed is that if you have tons of allergies and I'll, I'll, I'll share with you this, this one patient and tons of autoimmune problems and reactions to everything, then yes, that would be probably something that uh, would be a red flag, but having allergies alone is not enough to predict, at least in my experience. So this patient wrote, I have POTS, which is a postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, which is considered an autoimmune um, problem. Sjogren's, which is an autoimmune and inflammatory disorder and rheumatoid arthritis, which is an autoimmune and inflammatory disorder. I also have various food and other allergies. What are my choices for hernia repair? Well, I think, you know, it's obviously a very challenging situation. And I think going into that and trying to, you know, as you said, you know, do some sort of allergy testing or skin sensitivity testing, you know, may be beneficial in these patients. There are other things like, you know, the interesting thing is polypropylene, which is what most of the mesh is made out of, is something that people are often in contact with, yeah. you know, in a fairly regular basis. And yeah. so, you know, while some of those are autoimmune things, I think the other thing that I get a little bit nervous about are people that have had surgeries that are spitting sutures quite a bit. Yeah. Um, and it seems- Can you to explain what spitting sutures is? So like, if you notice that whenever you have a uh, surgery at sites where they've put 
like sewed things closed, you have, um, you know, drainage or that place gets infected and it's kind of continually happening. Mm -hmm. Your body obviously doesn't like that material. Yeah. Um, and so often when you say spit is because you can kind of see the suture as your body tries to um, get rid of it actually. Yeah. Um, and so I think, you know, working with an allergist, but honestly, I think the mesh in general is fairly safe and you would probably be okay. And this is where I'm like a little bit curious about, um, and again, this is no data, uh, about how these, you know, by like longer acting bile reabsorbable meshes function, because yeah. I think it, there is a lot of concern about mesh out there, which is reasonable. Um, I think in general mesh is actually fairly safe. Um, but you know, I, th we also, are now practicing a world where patients are educated and they know themselves. And honestly, we don't have a lot of data to say, Hey, I have put in a synthetic mesh in someone that has multiple, you know, allergies has, you know, um, autoimmune diseases, that mesh is going to be just fine. So you're kind right. of operating with m all of the information you have, but you know, is there data to guide your practice in that specific patient actually no. Um, and so it will be interesting to see, you know, how, these meshes uh, perform. And at the end of the day, what we do know is they're probably safe, but your risk of recurrence is a little bit higher. So if you're like, listen, I, you know, sit down with your patient counsel, say, listen, I can, you know, I think a synthetic mesh is safe. This might be an option for you. I would be more than happy to do any allergy testing or skin mm -hmm. sensitivity testing. Um, at the end of the day, if we do put in a prosthetic that isn't permanent, you might have a recurrent hernia. All yeah. the is, you know, you know, 15%. And at the end of the day, you can say, you know, there's a 15% that this is going to come back or an 85% chance that you're going to be totally fine. And it's just yeah. kind of the numbers and how you look at them. Yeah. I think up until now, we we're not discussing this with the patients. We promised a perfect repair. Mm -hmm. uh, and now we need, we are spending more time, you know, weighing the risks and benefits and saying, you know, maybe recurrence is not as important to you. You're happy with a 70% success rate which in our society is horrible. We, you know, we want a 95% or better. Um, and I'll, you know, accept a 20%, 30% re recurrence rate, knowing that you've done your best to try and reduce your risk of, let's say, a uh, mesh allergy or, or some recurrence or fistulas or drainage, chronic drainage, or just feeling malaise because you have an implant in you that's, that's not suited to your mesh. Um, Okay, next question. How can you distinguish allergy versus infection from a mesh? Um, so a lot of times when we talk about allergies, it's kind of the skin redness that you have. And then we are talking about this like autoimmune reaction. So people mm -hmm. often feel like they have, you know, they're fatigued all the time. They have changes to their bowel or bladder habits that are new, the chronic pain, the migraines, you know, new rashes and stuff like that. So that's kind of the very much um, allergic or um, autoimmune reaction to the mesh. Right. Um, when we talk about infection, a lot of times you'll see, you know, we get imaging, there's fluid on top of the mesh. The mesh is like there's stuff draining that looks like pus, yeah. um, or, you know, this, there's a, you know, you can kind of tell the difference between red, that's an allergy where it's like well demarcated where the mesh is versus like, this is infected. It's hot. It's right. angry. It's draining. Um, you know, that is an infected piece of mesh. Have you ever dealt with a low grade mesh infection? So these are people that probably have their body is constantly fighting a very low grade infection. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen that people, they have like joint pains and just malaise, really nothing else. And uh, they probably have a risk for having it. So uh, it was placed maybe in a not necessarily clean situation. Um, have you seen that? And is there anything that you've noticed in that patient population that's predictive that maybe mm -hmm. that's what they have? Well, I think, um, you know, I was operating on a patient that had a seroma that was drained. He was totally fine. Mm -hmm. um, and then it came back and on the ski CT scan, it looked like, you know, simple fluid. He had no fevers. He had no chills. He noticed a bulge um, where the seroma was no skin redness. And I'm like, okay, you know, this is sitting right on top of your mesh. We should probably go in, take your mesh out. Um, and we, and I was like, we'll do, you know, 
put a new piece of, piece of mesh and do something nice and definitive for you because it is just a seroma. Um, nothing but pus. No. Like, so much pus. Wow. It, was, it was insane. And I was like, I had to close him primarily because I was like, I can't put a mesh in this situation. Um, but I think I have always like, your body is so clever at kind of walling off the yeah. chronic infections. Like it doesn't want there to be bacteria everywhere. And I think it's pretty common when you're operating for, you know, these persistently infected um, meshes or these like low grade infections that when you get in, you find something that is way more than you ever thought it was um, because wow. your body's yeah. actually done That's a pretty good job of, of walling stuff off. Have you seen anyone react to the Sepra film or the barrier used? Uh, like, I guess Secure Mesh had that kind of fish oil, yeah. omega, omega fatty acid. Have mm. you seen allergies to that? I have not actually. No. Yeah, there's, you know, on the IHC, there's been some discussion of uh, reports that some surgeons had where they felt the Sepra film um, reacted. I'm not so sure that it wasn't just the mesh itself at yeah. the time. Well, I'm convinced that, again, no data to support this, that yeah. the um, um, barrier coated meshes, although, so in reality, so these meshes are meshes that we place touching the bowel and the film that is on the bottom of them, the separate film goes away. So it doesn't last forever. Um, and in reality, it's sort of built to like a week. You know, yeah. Do that, you know, prevent the bowel from adhering to it and then have the strength on the side that interacts with the abdominal wall so that you don't yeah. get the occurrence. But I find that those meshes must be processed a little bit differently mm. because I'm sure as you notice, you know, these people have had um, you know, let's say if you've had an intra-abdominal piece of mesh place, and then you have like diverticulitis or like, you know, cholecystitis and they spill some bile, like those meshes, something happens to them and yes. heaven forbid there's any sort of bacteria, albeit like, it doesn't really make sense why that happens because if yes. you put, there's no, again, no barrier coating at this point, that mesh in the retrorectal space would be totally fine if something happened, but those meshes just don't, you know, function well. And we do have data that said that, you know, salvage in of those meshes in those situations is like zero. So, yes, so yeah, you I don't have to remove it. Yeah. yeah. All infected mesh needs to be removed. There was a, um, a surgeon that reached out and was like, you know, I have this infected mesh, but I was going to go in there and just kind of take out what, as much as I could. I said, no, 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 you got to take out all of it. Mm -hmm. Oh, but is it really necessary? Yes. He's like, but there's this little voice in me that says it'll be fine. I said, we've all had that little voice, my friend. <laughs> it's been proven over and over. Do not listen to that voice. It's an incorrect voice. So uh, yeah, at least we have, again, we try and do as much evidence-based surgery as possible. Um, we're often the ones that are coming up with the data because through experience and uh, there's a comment about, do you have any true data on polypropylene and link with autoimmune disease? Everything is a correlation right now. We don't have true data that says like this caused that. We can just say the patient was totally normal. They got mesh, now they're abnormal. We took out the mesh, now they're normal again. Mm -hmm. And so we're kind of correlating it and they may or may not have an allergy test or any other kind of objective manner of approving that correlation. So no, we currently do not have any fancy studies um, to support a lot of what we say. Um, and we're still learning. We're still mm -hmm. learning. Yeah. It would be uh, great to have that data, but in yeah. reality, I think most hernia studies sort of end at two years. And after that, we have no idea how the mesh is performing and what's going on. Which is why this uh, ACHQC, our quality collaborative is so important because that follows the patient through their lifetime. Mm -hmm. One patient wrote, thinking back to some oral surgery I had 20 years ago, I spit out the stitches several times and I never connected that to my issues with hernia mesh reaction. So that's interesting to hear that correlation now. I did react to some of the mesh samples when I had allergy testing, but it turns out I react to really any foreign body implant, not just allergic to a particular type. Is there any way to predict foreign body reaction? No. No, not really. Have you had patients that have infections complain of a burning pain? I have allergies, foreign body reactions, and autoimmune response. And I'm wondering if the constant burning is a low grade or encapsulated infection. 
think it's hard, like a burning is, uh, I think a lot of times like a very um, much a nerve related complaint. Yeah. And so I wonder if the reason that you're having the burning sensation is that your infection may or may not be close to a nerve that's causing you that sensation. Yeah. Here's an interesting question. I had a hysterectomy recently and the adhesions on my ventral mesh repair were so thick, they couldn't view the upper abdomen. I had endometriosis everywhere. Is it possible that endo could spread to that mesh? I don't see why not actually. Yeah, uh, endo can go anywhere, but mm -hmm. I, I, I would highly recommend if someone has had a major abdominal wall reconstruction or mesh and they're planning on having another abdominal wall, another surgery that uses the abdominal wall, whether it's urology, gynecology, colorectal, reach out to your hernia surgeon or mm -hmm. to a surgeon specialist in that same pro like neighborhood to help out because I don't like it when they call me... <laughs> later on yeah uh -huh. we had this infection or our wound opened up and now your mesh is exposed or i'm like wait you went in a belly and didn't tell me like mm -hmm. i want the med patient to tell me and i want the um surgeons to tell me and in my hospital they already know so they call me they're like hey so this patient now has such and such cancer we're going to go in there we want to make sure we don't screw up the the repair you did so i go in there and i help them enter mm -hmm. uh, because I know where the mesh is. I know how to handle that. Whereas other specialties don't necessarily. Uh, and then what I try and do is to make sure that my repair is not disrupted by whatever they're doing. Um, like someone needs a stoma, they need a urostomy and they're mm -hmm. like, they knew, they knew enough to know that they should have put stoma through mesh. Mm -hmm. um, but they also didn't want to screw up the, the hernia repair. So I was there to, to help with that. Do you get that? Well, that? Do you have that collaborative? We do. Yeah. And I think um, whenever I see patients, especially when I do these complex abdominal wall reconstructions, I'm like, listen, nobody goes into your abdomen without me knowing. And if we can make it happen, I will be in there when they go into your abdomen. Because, you know, once you kind of have done, you know, coated someone's abdominal wall with mesh, you know, hernias that come back after that situation can be yeah. very challenging to fix. Yeah. Um, and while there is a lot of people that are fixing hernias and doing complex abdominal wall in general, the number of people that need that, thank goodness is small in relation to the whole population. Yeah. And so it's not something that people will commonly like other surgeons of subspecialties commonly, um, handle or deal with. And so I think, especially when you're kind of like, listen, this is what I've done. I know where my mesh is. I know what type of mesh I have. I know how to mitigate any recurrences or complications with what you're doing. It's essential that if you've had hernia surgery, um, you know, even as a patient, I would say like, try to get a hold of your op notes <laughs> um, so that heaven forbid you need surgery again, people know where your mesh is and what mesh you have. Yes, that's for sure. really even hard for us to hunt down sometimes. Yeah. It makes a huge difference. Um, let's move on to more like pain uh, questions. How does mesh cause pain in either an open or tap or tap inguinal hernia repair? <laughs> that's a big question. Oh my gosh. We could talk all night about that. Um, <laughs> okay. So this is brief. <laughs> my like spiel. I'll make it quick. I think yeah. the biggest thing is, you know, especially in the inguinal realm, um, people have been told that their mesh is the source of their pain. Yeah. When in reality, I think, you know, there was probably something like the mesh is doing something that's causing pain. It's not the mesh that is the problem. It's like the location of the mesh. Um, and so obviously, uh, when you're doing a tap or tap inguinal hernia repair, you know, I was just with Dr. Chen at AHS and the only safe place to put any fixation is basically on Cooper's everything else is battleship in terms of hitting nerves. Yeah. And so the best you can do is, um, you know, make sure that you are not putting any sort of fixation, um, you know, below the myopicterial orifice, stay away from the nerves the surgeon should carefully dissect out the cord, but in reality, there are so many reasons that your, um, tap or tap mesh may be causing pain, um, recurrence, you know, any sort of a uh, nerve or, um, you know, inadvertent injury to nerves that are there, tax fixation, all of that stuff. And so I think, you know, I have this 
conversation every single day in clinic. It's not the mesh that's causing you the pain. It's how the mesh was put in. That's, you know, causing you the pain that mesh truly has never been recalled. It's a very, very safe piece of mesh, but I think we are starting to understand all of the nuances to inguinal hernia surgery that we people were unaware of before. Um, and how challenging it can be to have a nice durable inguinal hernia. And I think the trickiest thing with this population of patients is oftentimes you're dealing with young, active, healthy males. Um, Mm -hmm. and so you're going from a, I want to be, you know, completely functional, no restrictions, feel nothing. Um, and you have to have, do a surgery that allows people to do that. And so they're, you know, everything matters. You have to be very careful in the OR, but in reality, it's probably not the mesh that's the problem, but the mesh is irritating something that is the reason you're having pain. Yeah. And I want to say, if you go to a doctor and they don't understand your problem, like you just very nicely explain where there's many facets of pain and, and they just say, uh, all pain is mesh pain. I would run away because that is a horrible way. And you overtreat patients. You often don't do right by them. And Um, I've heard that said before, and I'm just, I was just floored when Mm -hmm. I'm like all mesh, all pain is mesh pain. What if there's a recurrence? Nope. That's mesh pain. Mm -hmm. Um, what if it's a nerve problem? No, that's mesh pain. I'm like that. You're just not thinking right now. (laughs) This Mm -hmm. makes no sense to me. Um, okay. We have a comment here after having this polypropylene hernia mesh inside my body for almost 20 years, it went really bad. Uh, no testing was ever done by the FDA. This just floors me. It doesn't matter if the mesh was recalled or not. Polypropylene mesh is garbage. Well, I'll just make the comment um, that if you've had the mesh in you for 20 years, then the likelihood that whatever problem you have now is related to the mesh is close to zero. Uh, okay, there's more about this. I got terrible skin rashes and never knew why. I came to find out the polypropylene hernia mesh was more than likely causing these terrible skin rashes. I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis and I had all of this BS hernia problems at the time. Nobody wants to look into the facts though. It's it's uh, a big nightmare. So we are trying to look at the facts. I would say if your allergies started 20 years later, it's probably not the mesh. Um, that's just not how allergies work. Um, but if you need the mesh out and it's a low risk procedure, you know, we're not God, we're not, we don't know everything. So we're happy to consider taking that out. Um, This is a good question. There are no long-term studies on the degradation byproducts within the body from these implants. The chemical process involved cause so many other reactions that's not just cut and dry CO2 and H and H2. Have any other absorbable meshes been evaluated for longer periods? Uh, I think the answer is no, actually. A lot of the bioabsorbables are very new. Um, and I think, you know, the biologics are also something that I, you know, people put in very commonly. I actually very infrequently use biologic slash never, um, use biologics because I find that those, um, the, the predictability. And so I think that's why some of these bioabsorbable meshes became, are becoming a lot more popular because they degrade through a particular f- fashion. Yeah. Um, Whereas some of the biologic meshes, really how they're interacting, nobody really knows. Um, I've had situations where the mesh has been there and looks fine. I've had situations where the mesh has just become like putty almost sitting there. And then I've had situations where we've actually had to use a sternal saw to cut through biologic mesh because the patient ossified their whole abdominal wall. Wow. Yep. And so... It this was an absorbable mesh, which obviously has yeah. 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 Um, and so I think, you know, that's sort Everybody of the body is different. Everybody's, Everybody's different. Is different. It's yeah. impossible to predict what is going on. I think um, in general, technique matters more than probably the mesh that's being put in. Yes, I agree. Uh, and in, in general, like this is kind of the sad thing. And um, we actually had a grand rounds here by a Euro urologist that does the female urology that talked about the whole mesh problem with, you know, pelvic organ prolapse. And that's actually a, a polypropylene piece of mesh. Like yes. it is something that we use every day, but in that situation was absolutely terrible and caused a ton of problems. Yes. 
And so I can only imagine as a patient, how confusing it is to be when you're like, okay, there's this mesh. That's the same right. mesh that my hernia surgeon is putting in, but it shouldn't be used here, but they're going to use it here. Like yes. it's so confusing. So um, and in reality, like, honestly, when you think of the total numbers, you know, we probably do about 300,000 plus hernia repairs every year in the U S the overwhelming majority of those people are one getting, million. I'm going to correct oh, that number. It's one million. Yeah. A million hernia surgeries every year. The majority of those people are getting mesh. So in general, mesh is fairly safe and it's actually pretty good. Yes. Um, there are some nuances to putting mesh in and where to put it and what mesh to use. Yes. And we do need a lot more data, but like, I think there is this overwhelming fear that mesh is terrible and shouldn't be used. In reality, it's, you know, probably not as bad. A lot of people do just fine, but you certainly need to sit down with your surgeon and talk about risks, benefits, alternatives, all of these things that can help you have a great outcome after your You are surgery. so right. That's so well said. Um, next question. I had left inguinal hernia surgery six years ago with a plug and patch and have since had horrible pain. No one, uh, no one doctor said I have a left inguinal hernia and he, oh, now one doctor said I have a left inguinal hernia and he found three other hernias, which he wants to fix with mesh. How can I have a left inguinal hernia repaired? Well, you want to talk about the plug and patch? I was going to ask you, how do you feel about the plug and patch? I think we feel the same way. <laughs> uh, yeah. So the plug and patch, let's talk some history here, was introduced as a way to, fix a hernia without doing a big incision, without doing a lot of dissection and therefore a shorter recovery time. And it was uh, developed by one set of surgeons and then improved by another, set, by another surgeon uh, as to how to put it in. In retrospect, that was not a good idea for two reasons. One is it's way too much mesh. We're putting in a ball of mesh and now many people have literally like, feel like they have a ball of mesh in them. And so I, I explain it and we call those mesh I explain it like a, having a pebble in your shoe mm -hmm. and now you have to walk. So unfortunately that needs to be removed. Um, it may still be one of the more common meshes that are sold by the company, but at the time it was the number one selling mesh. And so now we have a lot of people around. Again, most people did well, but of all the meshes that are, that are put in, it seems that the mesh plug and patch has the most, but we actually looked at our data and looked at all the meshes we removed and to see if there was a preponderance of one style of mesh versus the other. And actually the plug was number two. Regular flat mesh had more problems um, mm -hmm. than the plug, believe it or not. But the second issue is it kind of forced surgeons not to understand anatomy and be really delicate with what they were doing. They just kind of jammed something into a hole and called it a day. And that was kind of a, this kind of, horrible way that um, mesh was tried to be made easier. And so over time, people were not really appreciating anatomy, which like back in the day when they were doing tissue repairs, you really had to know your anatomy to know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, whereas it's really hard to screw up a, a mesh repair because the mesh does so much of the scarring and, and so on in addition to it. So uh, yeah. yeah, if you do have mesh plug problems that just needs to be removed. Um, there's Here's no other that. way for that. This is oh, a mesh plug. I, yes. uh, I often bring this stuff to clinic because people want to know what it is. Yes. I have my little like mesh package I bring to that's clinic. A, that's a large mesh plug. This is a mesh plug. It's literally yes. a bad tin birdie. Yeah. Yeah. Shuttlecock or birdie. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot of, a lot of, uh, I mean, some people won't feel it, but if you're a ballerina or someone thin or, or have, uh, for god forbid a uh, propensity towards reacting to implant that's a lot of implant mm -hmm. well and i think the um question was asked how can you have other hernias yeah. so a lot of times the mesh plug was placed in the indirect space um there are multiple places that you can develop hernias in the inguinal area and it's not impossible to have a recurrence after a plug placement. So, you know, if your surgeon says you have a plug and you have more hernias, that is something that exists. Um, and so, you know, you probably need your plug out as well as it sounds like maybe some other hernias fixed. Yeah. The other comment is, isn't it time that we, you know, move forward with a hundred percent certainty about what we're doing? Um, what's your thought on that? Why are we doing all this when we don't have 100% certainty in every action that we do? 
I think it would be impossible to get 100% certainty because you're asking for 100% certainty for one person and not everybody is the same. And so the best we can say is like for, you know, this patient population, number one, just to get enough people to say, we know 100% certainly that this is going to be okay is like almost a, a never event because there's so many things that people can have. There's so many, you know, autoimmune diseases, sensitivities, allergies, like to actually get a good number of patients with that and long-term follow-up that had the same sort of hernia characteristics. I mean, we can only get as close. And I think there are a whole bunch of people that are really invested in trying to examine exactly how things are performing the best we can. But just the, you know, sheer statistics of trying to get to a hundred percent is just, you know, it'll take some time and a lot of people. I think one of the frustrations that there is in medicine is nothing we do is hundred percent, nothing, zero. Like I can give you aspirin for your, I can give you Advil for your pain and it won't deal with hundred percent of your pain. I can give you a blood pressure medication and not hundred percent of people will have a good response to that blood pressure medication. I can take out a breast tumor or do breast surgery and we won't have hundred percent results in that surgery or a knee surgery or knee implant. Nothing that we do is hundred percent. It's kind of the world we live in and it's a risk benefit ratio. And that's why we have a lot of regulation to make sure that we're, we're we are aiming to be as close to 100% as possible and that we're not we're not doing operations like Dr. Death, the neurosurgeon, where he had all these horrible complications because there is a lot of oversight in our practices um, that maybe people aren't aware of. And a lot of this issue with the current vaccine and is we're not, we don't have vaccines that work 100%. No. And people are very frustrated. Like, how could you recommend that everyone get this vaccine as mm-hmm. a mandate when it doesn't work 100%. So um, it is frustrating. That's what science is. Science is not 100%. Engineering is, mm-hmm. you know, we don't build homes that, you know, uh, if done correctly, they all, they all do well. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we, when we put sinks in, you know, it's pretty much guaranteed that the sink will function. But um, yeah, medicine is not like that. And it's, it's very frustrating for patients to kind of grasp that, especially when they're in that, that portion of the fail, the failure portion. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know if you have any more to add to, to that comment. Well, yeah. And I, um, you know, it's very much people don't say I do medicine. They say I practice medicine and it truly is a situation where people are constantly learning. We're constantly trying to make things better. And at the end of the day, it is, you know, the evidence that we have, the experience that we have to put forward our best practice recommendations for a patient. Um, And, you know, I said to a patient today, like, listen, she was nervous. She had mesh in and was getting a colonoscopy. She says, I worried that they might perforate my colon because I have this mesh. And I said, you know, you're going to be totally fine. Everything looks and feels okay. But at the end of the day, you know, when you say, well, your risk of having a, you know, perforation with a colonoscopy is, you know, one in a thousand percent or whatever it is, if it happens to them, it's a hundred percent. And so while risks and, you know, ratios do matter, if you're the person that's in, you know, the one to 5% that has a recurrence or, you know, higher percent that has a complication, it doesn't matter. You are a hundred percent. And so, you know, people on the um, medicine as a whole is really trying to do what's best for the patient population, but obviously we don't have all the answers and we're trying to make things better every can every day that we can. And when we kind of notice that things aren't going as, as we thought, you know, we invest in getting more data and figuring out why, and, you know, really, you know, as you had mentioned with the, the mesh companies, like advocating to say, Hey, listen, like your mesh isn't performing how we thought, maybe we should yeah. investigate this so that we can do the safest thing for our patients. So we have a lot of positive comments. I appreciate your focus on collecting data and considering every variable such as technique, allergy, mesh type, et cetera, to avoid harm in your patients. Both of you are amazing doctors. That's very kind. Um, here's another question. Uh, well, you know what? We have one minute. Wow. We didn't even go through the over 20 questions that were submitted. Oh. I'm going to save these because some of them were really, really good. We may have to come back if you're agreeable to come back in oh, 2022 absolutely. for these. 
so many great questions. Um, wow, what can I say? I'm very impressed, you guys. This was like a very quick bam, 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 going through lots of questions, lots of really fantastic, um, really fantastic like insight. And I love that the fact that everyone was so interested in in what we have to say. <laughs> I appreciate that. I say this every week. I love that people tune in and then they do again. So, um, oh, before we leave. So you may know a nice gentleman, Mr. Afam Onyema. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so I went to the Gianco Foundation uh, charity event uh, last so Friday. Jealous. It was fabulous. I was there with Kevin. Um, you went to uh, Nigeria mm -hmm. and volunteered your time. I know we're, we're going over. I never go over, but I want you to just give us a little blurb of what you did and, and maybe I'll do it. <laughs> um, well, yeah, it was awesome. So Dr. L. Hayek, um, who was a friend of yours, uh, yes. was a, a surgeon that trained me actually. Um, and when I was a chief resident, we went to Nigeria with the Gianco Foundation. So it is a family then they, um, his da Afam's dad yes. was a ob in Nigeria. And he had noticed that there was um, just a huge um, deficit of healthcare in uh, Nigeria itself. Um, and so uh, Afam has fundraised a ton of money to, you know, help educate women there. Yes. They did a, a, ton of, a ton of work with, um, you know, helping pregnant women get the appropriate testing. They're building schools for children yeah. there. They go down um, and do some orthopedic surgery. And what our goal was, um, was to teach some of the surgeons there how to do some minimally invasive, so laparoscopic surgery, because in the general surgery world, it's not very common. And especially when these people need to return to work sooner because their families rely on their income. Um, they can't have big wounds yeah. because obviously those are hard to heal. Yeah. Um, we were there to teach um, a couple of the surgeons there how to do laparoscopic surgery. And so it was awesome. Speaking of mesh and device companies, they, one of the companies we work with donated like $50,000 worth of medical equipment for um, the company there or for the hospital. Yeah. So it was, it was awesome. It was and great. These, these surgical missions, uh, most of the patients need hernia repairs. Yep. It's a thing. Uh, it's the most commonly needed operation for these people. And often because they have it as a child really it doesn't get, get addressed until they're, they're unable to work and it affects their ability to, to help their family. So yeah, Kevin, I think is going next week, this week or next week um, mm -hmm. for another mission in Nigeria. And um, I helped sponsor some, some work at the foundation. So I got this beautiful little letter handwriting. He's got this craziest handwriting. <laughs> He's a um, gentleman. Yeah, quite the gentleman, uh, just as a thank you note. Today, actually, I got the letter. So I was like, oh, I'm going to talk to Charlotte about it because yeah. that's that's something that she's done and hopefully I will do as well. All right, everyone, you guys have been great. I don't know how to thank you all. Uh, it's been a fantastic event. Thank you, Charlotte, for your fantastic uh, insight. I, I love that. I think I love it most because uh, I agree with everything you say. <laughs> um, it's kind of frustrating sometimes when a guest comes on, I'm like, eh, no, not really. Uh, but <laughs> you were like, I feel like we're on the same page. We're parallel, which uh, it just confirms that um, maybe with the thoughts that I'm having are all, also pretty correct if, if you have similar thoughts about these patients. So thank you everyone for coming. Thank you, Dr. Horn, for your time. I hope you can get back to your family ASAP. It's kind of getting late on your, your side of the world. Um, I'm tuning out. This is Hernia Talk Live question and answer session. We'll be back again next week for another uh, Hernia Talk Live session. Make sure you follow me on YouTube because this will be shared there. And Charlotte, if you ever need to share it with anyone, feel free to, and we will call it a day. Thanks, guys.